this. Um, you know, Richard, um, you know, in just uh, to recap in our last episode, your first uh, debut episode of Wealth Management uh, Living Again Post Pandemic, your show, um, we talked about a lot about, you know, um, being hopeful. Yeah, well, hi, Vicky. It's great to be back again for the second episode. Um, you, you talk about the future. I think one of the innate things in human and, and man is is hope. And uh, we always, I believe, hope for a better future, whether it's for ourselves, whether it's for our children. And uh, this is something that helps to drive us and to, to keep us going. Life is always going to throw up challenges. There are, yep. if, if we believe that life is just going to be smooth and plain sailing, maybe, you know, we're setting ourselves up for, uh, uh, you know, discomfort and... Uh, uh, Unexpected twists and turns. Yeah, these, these are going to be part and parcel and we need to uh, uh, realize that. And, um, you know, I mean, one of my, my mantras is to live life to the full. Uh, a simple um, mantra that is something that I like to live by on a daily basis. And, you know, the day that I'm on my deathbed, I'd like to feel that I can look back over my life and felt that I tried to do everything I could, um, tried to achieve everything uh, that, with the God-given talents I've been given and, um, you know, lead a, a, right. a fulfilling life. Yes, and Richard, um, I do know that you have been uh, living in Singapore for the last 20 years and your children in your last episode, you talked about um, the third culture. Um, what's your aspirations for your children as a father? Um, you know, you have traveled around the, you have traveled around the world, you've backpacked. What's your aspiration for that generation? My aspiration for my children is that they can fulfill their dreams. Mm. I'm not the kind of parent that is going to say this is the path that you must take because if it's not the one that they are motivated to do at some stage they'll uh, uh, find another path and they may have wasted many many years so I, I'm very much want to encourage them to find uh, their way in life to navigate the challenges of life but you know very often I will say to them ask yourself the question why why mm. is this important why mm. is this that you know what, what is it about this that motivates you mm. if, in life i feel that if you can find something that you are passionate about something that you are um, willing to work hard at and that you have talent if you can combine those three things um, almost certainly you're going to succeed um, yeah, and you know, Richard, where we are in Singapore right now, and a lot of viewers and listeners are all over the world, especially in America, or tune into my shows. Um, you know, in Singapore, there's such a culture where, um, you know, parents are always trying to dictate um, what their children should be doing, should be studying, and I, and and um, it is so common or just really cultural here that you've got a parent to say that, hey, you, you need to take the A maths, the additional mathematics, you need to take the pure uh, chemistry, you need to take the biology because you're going to lead you to medicine, um, or you're going to take literature because it's, you have a path in um, the degree of law, etc. You know, how, how do you manage that amidst um, your children's struggle because they are in the midst of Singaporean children who are pressured by Singaporean families or mothers or fathers. Oh, they go through the same <laughs> the same challenges because as, as anybody knows who's gone yeah. through a, a local education system, yeah. it's very taxing, it can be very stressful, albeit yeah. a very good education system. Uh, and I think some parents, though, they want to live their dreams through their children um, rather than let their children uh, fulfill their dreams uh, and, you know, not end up that the child yeah, resents sure. uh, going down a path to please yeah. their parents when it was yeah. something that they have no motivation or passion for sure. whatsoever. Yeah, but like, how do you do it? Because I'm very sure your children will be pressured, right? when they have their friends and 
and they were be saying, hey, you know, my friends are going to uh, go to the school because they want to go to the best, like the top schools and, you know, the rankings. Do they ever feel pressured? And how do you navigate their emotions? How did well, you I'm... balance their mind to tell them that, hey, it's okay. We're not, we're not going to like um, pressure you. Or how do you actually operationalize on that level? That's oh, I'll give you yeah. an example. Uh, yeah. Just last week, I was speaking yeah. with my youngest daughter. Yeah. She's uh, just coming up to 14 years old. She's coming up to the end of secondary two yes. uh, year, and she's having to choose what subjects she wants to go exactly. into. Exactly. <laughs> and she loves yeah. art. She mm. really likes art. She's yeah. good at art. She's yeah. passionate about art. Yeah. And, you know, I've said to her, um, follow your dreams, mm. uh, get some balance in the choice of your subject. So it's not mm. just um, all arts, although actually in Singapore, the, the minority of subjects is uh, in the arts, but, you know, get a balance in life and mm. choose something that you're passionate about. I said to her that too often here in Singapore, people are mm. looking at what grade can I get yes. when I take my <laughs> exam? And I actually said to her, I said to her, listen, yes, getting a grade uh, is yeah. good and yeah. do your best to get the best grades, but yeah. a good rounded education isn't just about getting a good grade, mm. it is about educating a mind and mm. how that child's mind is able to think, how is it able to reason, how is it able to question the world around them, which ultimately is going to help them navigate life much more so than drumming out robots that might be getting lots of A's but have no interpersonal skills or artistic flair. Do you ever feel the pressure yourself? <laughs> there, there is, but quite frankly, I, it's a bit of a water on a duck's back with me. <laughs> you know, I, you mentioned that I come from Oxford and actually yeah. I was surrounded by Oxford academia. My father yes. was a professor. <laughs> My uh, godfather wow. was a professor yeah. uh, in the sciences yeah. and I was a little bit of the black sheep of the family. Wow. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, when I look at yeah. uh, many of the students my father uh, would teach and I met up mm. with a lot of them during student parties, yeah. they were exceptionally bright yeah. people, uh, yeah. but didn't always have the communication skills or the street smart skills to mm. be able to operate in the, the general uh, world. They were, they were great in the world of academia, but not necessarily, um, you know, when communicating or motivating uh, other people around them. So there are different kinds of intelligence and uh, not everybody is cut out to be an academic. And this is what I'm saying to my children that do your best because having a good education is a hugely valuable asset but just getting an education for the sake of getting good grades is mm. very often missing the boat yeah and you know now that we're talking about your business here at one global um here and i did um search about one global you are you are um an offshoot of uh, a, another, I should say, the headquarters is located in Hong Kong, am I right? Would you tell us a little bit about One Global? Uh, this career that you have charted that is so different from what your dad has envisaged for you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so, yes. Uh, he was a professor of biochemistry, so wow. <laughs> he was away from uh, real estate investment. I mean, so. I failed in the chemistry, right, at, at <laughs> age of uh, 15. <laughs> right. Well, I when he used up. to try and teach me, he was way over my head and I would just get lost. I, I just want to go and have a one word yes or no answer, dad. And two two hours later, I'll be completely yeah, confused. I, but... I couldn't I couldn't even pronounce the words. They're, they're kind <laughs> of like, and then you got you got to kind of like get your spelling correct, right? Sure. <laughs> if you don't get it right, it means another thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you yeah. don't want to be poisoning people at the end. <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about One Global um, and, and this, uh, this, this, this setup that you have um, and the hierarchical uh, uh, company uh, of, of your company. Sure. Well, uh, just to let you know, the, the head office is actually here in Singapore. Mm. Um, we have a lovely converted uh, shop house unit um, at 127 Devonshire Road. 
We have offices in Hong Kong, mm. KL, Malaysia, I see. Middle East, South Africa, London. Mm. And the company really provides a great end-to-end -end service. So for anybody who wants to add international real estate to their investment portfolio, mm. but they just don't know how to get started or they feel that because it's overseas, they're not familiar with it. How do I get a mortgage? Who's mm. going to manage my property? Uh, how do I know it's a good investment? Uh, natural concerns that sometimes create barriers to entry. Yes. And what we have done is basically line up all the ducks and put the solutions in place to provide a complete end-to-end -end service, to, to provide a solution to every touch point throughout the investment life cycle from finding the right property that suits in, uh, your investment goals mm. all the way through to selling the property at some stage in the future when you wish to take back your profits. Yes, and, and that's a good introduction about um, your company. Uh, and today, we'll try to cover as much as possible. Uh, you know, for myself, I'm really interested uh, in real estate. Um, that's why I have been in France for the last seven years. Um, you, will, you um, ladies and gentlemen, you will hear um, in, the, in the next 20 minutes um, about perceived barriers of entry. About, uh, you know, this is what Richard talked about. Um, who's going to look after the property and probably uh, Richard can give a specific example, a specific scenario, a specific, a specific project um, that your company is currently doing. Um, how do you um, or how does someone like a Singaporean go about investing in, in it and how do you as a company take care of that project? And also about emotional investing versus research driven investing, something that I like and start with clarifying your investment goals. Well, that's and, where it uh, starts. Yeah. Uh, whenever I meet up with a client, it's very much about tailoring the right solution for the client. Each client's investment goals or aspirations can be different. And so the more clear that those goals are, the easier it is for me to advise that client. And so before even talking about a country, a city, mm. a specific neighborhood to invest, let's get clarity on those investment goals. Because unless yes. we get clarity, then yes. it's like, if we don't have a plan, well, any path will do. And so, to, you know, my way of working with a client is to clearly understand what are the investment goals. And I should say that probably 90% of the clients it is an investment decision. And what I mean mm. by that is they're investing in a property um, in an asset class that's going to help them grow their net worth. Mm. For our minority, and we still serve these profile of clients, people may be buying a property more for an emotional reason because yeah. it is a holiday home or it's a mm. retirement home. Uh, there are not all it's not always driven purely by the numbers and the return on investment yeah. so let's get clear on those investment mm. goals first and then what we will do is look at the right property mm. now one global has a large property portfolio in multiple countries uh, particularly strong in the uk with multiple uh cities uh, that we cover mm. uh, but we will source developments with top tier uh developers and this is very important because the last thing that you ever want to do is invest in a property and the developer goes bust and the property doesn't get built that's no good mm. for anybody so part of the due diligence process that we have and because we're licensed by the council of estate agents here in singapore mm. we legally are bound to doing thorough due diligence to mitigate as much as possible the risks of uh, investing with a rogue developer that doesn't deliver. So many of the developers that we work with are uh, public listed companies. You know, they're major players in real estate, which helps to reduce the likelihood of a default happening. And once we've then found the right property for the investor, um, we guide them through literally holding their hand through the whole journey. So that will start with introducing them to um, a panel of lawyers to get the conveyancing started. We'll introduce them to our mortgage brokers so that they can mm. apply and make sure that they can get financing on the property. And if it's an off plan property, that is to say it's uh, in the process of being built, when it gets to completion or in Singapore jargon, TOP, mm. uh, 
as it gets close to that point, we'll introduce them to our property management companies, which will do everything from handing over the property from the developer to make sure that there are no uh, defects, uh, marketing the property to tenants, uh, screening those tenants, uh, signing the lease agreement with the tenants, mm. collecting the rent all the way through to selling that property at some stage in the future. And um, a couple of questions that uh, you've packed a lot in that uh, we could we could try to unpack a little bit uh, further. Um, Richard, um, I think it's exciting because you're talking about, uh, like what you say, there are different categories of uh, investors who are looking for different things. Some are pure ROI, some are ROI plus other soft factors. Um, and could you define the character of one global? Um, I'm looking at it as it is a fine, it is an investment financial um, consulting company. Am I right? Well, yes, it is. Uh, we work very much in a consultative approach to help clients again clearly define their investment mm. goals and then match those investment goals with the right solution or the right the right property. Uh, due to licensing as well, we are mm. a licensed real estate agency uh, here in Singapore. We have to be licensed in order yeah. to uh, be able to do our to do business. a global project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're global. right. I mean, it's like if you do go to one of these uh, uh, agents uh, in Singapore, they are not licensed uh, to do uh, any projects out of the territory of Singapore. Am I right? Well, you, you have to have a, a international a, a, a real estate license mm. uh, to be able to sell whether it's locally or overseas yeah but if you're going to market properties that are overseas then that's mm. there's additional layers of due diligence that mm. we have to do on the developer uh, mm. again to reduce the risk so that if a person who resides here in singapore invests we have done everything we possibly can to reduce the chance that something goes wrong along the way um, right. It's it's you know nothing is guaranteed, but by having these extra uh, check boxes that we have to comply with mm. by law, again it helps to reduce the likelihood of something going wrong uh, wrong along the way. And unfortunately, in, uh, in real estate, there are like I suppose in any industry, there are rogue developers, and uh, there are times where people have had a bad experience and. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a, it's very sad, and I can understand these people who've been burned are very cautious moving forwards. Mm. I would just like to encourage that if they have had a challenge, um, I'm sorry to hear that, but I would like to encourage them to to have a chat so that one we can build up a level of trust, but two to go through the due diligence process to help give them some peace of mind if they yeah. do wish to reconsider investing in overseas property again. Yeah, you know, Richard, um, you know, we've got to know you um, through our last episode and this episode. And, and we, I, I'd like to get to know One Global a little bit more. Um, you know, and I think you're right. There are people who were burned when there was a hype about investing in Myanmar. Like some five years ago, there was a hype about investing in China. Um, and, and I'm not uh, particularly talking about uh, 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 this country or that. There's no discrimination. I'm talking about when people just go with the hype, what they read on the newspaper, right? When we're talking about Myanmar, you've got Aung San Suu Kyi. She was being released and it was a big hype and people just rushed in, right? Uh, people talked about, oh, the economy is going to be good. And, and, and I, I foresee that, um, you know, and I was presented opportunities with that. Uh, myself, and, and also numerous, numerous opportunities since the 19, since the early 2000 about investing um, in various uh, countries, probably like in, in China. Um, I'm just saying for an example, okay, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Bangkok, etc. I, I think there is a risk when we don't have some, when we do not do enough of professional due diligence, wherever it is. If we, if the project is in Germany, right? It looks good on paper, right? Um, you've been presented with something. I mean, I've been presented with so many opportunities in Australia. Um, you know, that, that the person uh, called One Global Service, uh, and I'm looking at One Global as an entity, as a living person, um, holds with it the kind of philosophy, the kind of values that the company uh, and, and 
uh, embraces about the relationship between the company and the client. And you have been trying to clarify, yes, this is what we do. And this is the assurance that we give because we need to check the boxes uh, and make sure that whatever project we bring uh, and represent, they must have cleared uh, the bar with us first. Am I right? Can you can you clarify that? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it all comes down to really risk and reward. If you are investing in a, an emerging market, then there are other risks. There are mm. political risk. There is currency risk. Uh, how strong is the rule of law? Can you enforce a contract oh, in that yes. country if the, the developer goes rogue? Is there a change in legislation that suddenly mm. overnight can uh, mean that it's killed the deal? So yes. at the end of the day, risk reward is very important. And mm. on one side, depending on your risk profile and exposure to, to risk, one person might say, well, look, yes, I'm very aggressive. I don't mind going into high risk. But know the facts is that potentially you might invest into an emerging market and who knows, potentially, you might make a great capital gain. Mm. But conversely, if something goes wrong, how do you protect your downside? Because you could lose everything. And what we've discovered over the years um, with the profile of clients that we generally uh, service is that clients would rather have a safe haven market where we see mm. good, steady growth over a medium to long term as opposed to trying to become a millionaire overnight and investing into an emerging market that potentially could give you higher returns, but potentially you know, could lose everything. So this is part of the process when speaking with a client. One of the questions I'll ask is, what is your uh, uh, risk profile? Would you uh, define yourself as aggressive, moderate, uh, or conservative? Um, how do you see real estate fitting into your investment portfolio? Would you like to take a more conservative approach because other parts of your investment portfolio are more aggressive and get some balance within that investment portfolio? And where does real estate sit in that? Yeah, uh, and, and I looked at um, your projects here um, at One Triangle. Um, could you like to walk us through this flow of process? Like, for example, I come into your um, webinar or your seminar um, at uh, uh, the Four Seasons Hotel or, uh, you know, on Zoom uh, webinar, and you've got a project, right? Mm -hmm. Walk us through very quickly, like your 10-step kind of uh, uh, process for someone like myself. Sure. Well, well, first of all, before we even look at a specific project, what we'll do yeah. is... Um, uh, analysis and due diligence on is mm. there a strong investment case first of all mm. that country so we look at the macros yeah. you know is there political stability is there currency yeah. stability is there a good rule of law yeah. um, what is the overall supply demand of that country and then we start to zoom in on a, a city and then we start to zoom in on a neighborhood and we look for a variety of things okay be uh, before we go into that let's i, th I think this is so interesting and it's so interesting for potential uh, uh, clients of yours to know actually the process of you uh, shortlisting a project that you would like to represent. Am I right? So yes. I think that process gives uh, someone like myself the kind of assurance. Like, for example, you've got this one triangle project from Ashford, um, and then you've got another project, um, uh, Ashford Kent. You've got another project um, uh, around the triangle. Now, how do you uh, exactly do that, like shortlisting that and doing that due diligence? Uh, um, like you with your board of directors come in to say that, hey, we've got like 10 projects, but out of 10 projects, we shortlist three, and out of three, we only take two. Um, how, does, how does it go? I mean, well, for again, it to it, make it the mark. Yeah, yeah, it starts at a higher level. So we're looking, so let's say we're looking at Ashford. Ashford yeah. is a, one of the best connected commuter belt towns mm. uh, just outside of London. Yeah. And we've seen through the pandemic that there's yeah. been a, a migration from city centre mm. living to the okay. suburbs and yeah. commuter belt towns. Yeah. So we've seen that 
the uh, growth rate has been extremely strong in these kind of commuter belt towns. So there are many commuter belt towns around London. So let's look at not just the average, let's, let's find a commuter belt town that's going to outperform average. Yeah. Otherwise, why use one global? Yeah. So we then start looking, what is the, let's say, starting off with things like, what is the supply demand? Mm. Uh, what is the population growth? Those are two things that go hand in hand. If you've got an undersupply on one hand mm. and you've got population growth on the other, uh, mm. it's a double whammer. And mm. almost certainly there is going to be growth because when um, uh, demand outstrips supply, whether that's because there's an undersupply or overpopulated uh, area, then prices will go up. Um, so these are some some key things. What is the regeneration that's going on that's going to be adding value to that town? What is the employment like in that town or that mm. suburb? Um, you want uh, places where there is high rates of employment. What mm. is the connectivity? So with Ashford, one of the great pluses of, of this town and why we chose this over other community developed towns is that it's not only connected to London in 29 minutes on British Rail, but it's also connected on the Eurostar, which is the train mm. system that allows you to travel at high speed in Germany, under two hours to Paris, to Paris. And about an hour and a half to Brussels, mm. and also to, to Amsterdam. So mm. if you're living in Ashford, you can be in uh, four major cities mm. uh, within a few minutes. And the project mm. that we have called the Triangle is literally just mm. 10 minutes walk wow. from the uh, train station. And it sits right beside a beautiful park and river, mm. uh, which is what people are looking for. You know, an interesting statistic that came out uh, from one of my uh, colleagues recently in, a, in another seminar was that pre-COVID, the number one uh, reason that somebody chose to live in a particular apartment or home was its proximity to public transport and the second mm -hmm. was proximity to where people work. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at what is the main driver for people choosing a property, it's actually accessibility to open parkland mm -hmm. and open space. Yes. And so what we've seen in the space of 18 months of people have radically changed mm -hmm. what they need in a home yeah. and they're looking yeah. for more space. They're yes. looking for somewhere that's got a uh, an additional room or a home office that they can yes. work from because they, they may be working full or part-time yeah. from home and they want to be able to access open space and greenery so that they get out and exercise um, you know if additional lockdowns or restrictions yeah. come up in the future so that's hashtag need for space go to ashford <laughs> you know well, you just get more bang for your buck it's you know yes. the, price, the average price of property is 39 percent cheaper than the average property yeah. in london and uh, uh yeah and i'm looking at uh the numbers that you have given me um the growth numbers and also um some of these uh uh i should say rois also are you able to run uh with us What's that potential um, range of investment into um, this project of Ashford uh, Kent, which I will, I will show uh, uh, in, in the picture a little bit later on? Um, what's that price range? Um, how, do they, how do they get the loan? Like, you know, go through that 10 step process or shorter. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, what's that return on investment? Right. Well, starting with the uh, mortgage and getting access to financing, mm. again, part of the process is before I even talk about mm. uh, zooming in on a particular investment, let's, yeah. let's get at some confidence around whether you're going to be eligible for a mortgage. Yes. Or even signing or uh, reserving a property. Yeah. What I'll do is I will put them in touch with one of our mortgage quality. brokers. Yeah. And the mortgage broker will go through a, a thorough fact find and yeah. they will come back to them usually within two or three days to say, yeah. yes, based on the information you've provided, you're going to be eligible for a mortgage. So at least they've got some comfort yeah. that they are eligible. It's not a mortgage offer, but at least they've got some comfort around the fact that they should be eligible as long as their financial situation doesn't change. 
Um, when it walk, comes walk us through a little bit about this um, process, because I do know that um, you know a lot of uh, local banks do not give uh, out uh, loans for uh, projects outside Singapore. We're talking about UOB. We do, you know we're we're talking we're even talking about HSBC. Um, they don't do that. Um, how how does one get that mortgage uh, from you or from your one of your brokers? Sure. Well, local banks, UOB, OCBC, and so on, uh, they will tend to lend in prime central London. And the reason one and being, two, right? Yeah, zone, what we call zones yeah. one, two, and maybe yeah. even out to zone three. Yeah. And the reason being is that because they're Singapore banks, they're not so familiar with the mm. market in the UK. So sure. they, they have offices in the center of London, and typically yeah. they feel comfortable to lend on property in the center of London. Yeah. But when we work with a mortgage broker, they have access to over 200 lenders in the UK. Mm. And this gives you access to a far greater range of products. Wow. And it may be that you think that I can't qualify for a, a mortgage, but you'll be amazed that different banks have different criteria mm. and the mortgage broker knows this. Yeah. And so the value of using a mortgage broker is yeah. that they have these relationships with these yeah. banks. They know how to prepare the mortgage mm. applications. They know the do's and don'ts, and they know See. which lender is more likely to lend based on your profile. So um, can I say that uh, uh, we are really, uh, One Global is actually the, um, I should say the door to go to the door towards getting uh, uh, getting that uh, mortgage for that dream uh, investment, right? Whatever investment that is. And, and, and that's something that we don't have in Singapore because we can't go to a bank. We can't go to HSBC, not even HSBC Global uh, because I've done that before. That's why I'm in France. You know, I, I got my French um, cards and all this. Um, you got to deal with the local there. So for one global property services, you actually cut short that whole search journey by having your so-called collaborators already there with you. Of course. I mean, time is money at the end of the day. Yeah. And one you of don't the value, have to go there, right? You know, value, one of the value adds is that what we will do is guide a client mm. through the whole process. We've done it for mm. thousands of clients. And wow. what this does is it gives... Mm it saves a huge amount of time. Mm. Uh, if you, you know, if you want to go and fly around the world and do all your due diligence, of yeah. course, you're more than welcome to do that. <laughs> I've done it for seven years. <laughs> that, that takes a lot of time and it takes a, yeah. a, a yeah. lot of money. Sure, and, sure. You know, if you, um, as we build up a level of trust with our clients, yeah. what we're doing is we have professional people that are doing that on your behalf. So mm. it's saving you a lot of time and travel. Mm. And all the other moving parts, uh, mm. we provide this one-stop shop solution so that mm. rather than kind of getting stuck, how do I find a mortgage or where's mm. the right, or who's the right lawyer to use or mm. who's going to rent out my property? This is a big mm. thing for Singaporeans because yeah. here in Singapore, because it's such a small place, many yeah. landlords actually rent out their own properties or yes. they have a local agent that... Yeah is not a professional property manager, but will do yeah. it kind of as a favor to keep the relationship going. Yeah. Whereas sure. in many other countries around exactly. the world, there are professional property yes. management companies, and that is their business to manage the property. They take a percentage of the monthly rental, but it yeah. means that you have peace of mind that your yes. asset, your property is well being maintained. professionally managed, yes. uh, which is thousands of miles away. Yeah, and it's well maintained. They make sure it's cleaned up. Um, when there is a change of your tenancy um, and, and they make sure um, the water, the bills, um, the structure, when there's a problem with insurance, they come, they come right in. Um, so you have that level of uh, assurance because you're dealing with people who are professionals on the other side. So it's almost like putting the money in a bank, right? But it is like putting the money in a real estate project. Uh, uh, am I right, uh, uh, Richard? Well, I think many people invest in real estate because it's something that they can understand. Yep. It's very tangible. Yep. And once you've bought the property, then 
the property typically takes care of itself. You've got a tenant mm. in there yep. that is paying the rent. Mm. In the UK, we can get what we call interest-only mortgages. Yep. And that means that your property is almost certainly going to be uh, cash flow positive every single yep. month. So you've got, yep. you've got this cash cow generating you income. Mm. Yep. And over the medium to long term, yep. the value of the property goes up. Yep. And because most people live in a property they've yeah. probably gone through buying their own property at some stage it's something mm. that they understand mm. uh, it resonates with many people and i think this is why property still for singaporeans and many people around the world is very often the preferred asset class to grow their wealth in yeah uh richard could you run through some uh, basic uh, roi numbers and the range of investment yeah. For a first time, uh, exper uh, ex first time non experienced investor for UK? Sure. So, when we look at return on investment, my definition is you know, how much money and capital have I put into this property mm. as a deposit? Yeah. And then when I come to sell it at the end, yeah. you know, what return have I made on mm. my capital? So, just to take a, a very simple example, if I bought a property in cash, yeah. that is, I went, I didn't get a mortgage, I bought it. 100% in cash. Let's say it's $100,000 uh, just mm. to make it a nice, easy round number. Yeah. And I sell that property in 10 years' time and it mm. has doubled in price. So I'm now selling at $200,000. Yeah. I've made a 100% return on my investment. Mm. Now, if you want to increase your return on investment, actually borrowing, which sometimes mm. in Asia and uh, certain countries is seen as a uh a bad word no you know people some people in in certain yep. cultures don't in like Asia. to take on debt they yep. want to pay everything in cash yes there is, there is good debt and there's bad debt yeah and when you can get financing why not the country yeah. sometimes for as little as one percent yeah then why not leverage because imagine yeah. you had a hundred thousand yeah but this time what you do is you buy two properties and you put mm. fifty thousand deposit mm. on each property both of the prices of those properties were a hundred thousand uh, dollars yeah and again let's take the same scenario that in 10 years time they both double in price yeah so once i've paid back the money to the the, the bank i've actually i've sold two properties now for two hundred thousand so that's yeah. a total combine of four hundred thousand i need yeah. to pay back the bank, a hundred thousand that I borrowed. Yeah, I've actually made two hundred thousand profit, or I've of made two hundred percent return right? on my investment. Of course. So I just mentioned that because that shows yep. the power of leverage and why, yes. when investing in real estate, yeah, you can get good, attractive financing yep. terms, and the interest rates around the yep. world are at an all-time low at the moment yep. for many yep. countries. Why not leverage? Because that's going to increase your yeah. ROI or your returns. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, countries like the UK, we are looking at a property where we could get 65 to 70% loan to value. And we hold that property for 10 years and then look mm. to sell. Mm. Projected return on investments are around about 150 to 200%. That's over a 10 year period. If you annualize that, then we're looking at about a 15 to 20% annualized return each yep. year. Yep. So my question then to a client is to say, well, look, mm. if this is a, a guideline, of course, at 15 to 20% annualized returns, and it's in a safe haven market, a country mm. like, let's say, the UK with a, mm. a strong rule of law, um, you know, a stable political system, yep. A place that people would say is a, a safe haven. Yep. You know, what kind of investments are you normally having to invest in to try and mm. get a 15 to 20 percent annualized course. return? Normally, well, of course. it's well, a course. high risk, volatile investment vehicle. So yep. the power of leverage allows you to still invest into a safe haven country mm. uh, and a safe haven asset class. Yeah. But that leverage can give you very attractive return on investment. Wow, um, that really excites me. <laughs> you know, I can hardly like sit still on my chair. Like Richard, um, tell us more about this project that, that you have um, 
that's in your hands that you've shortlisted because it meets your mark uh, about uh, Ashford. Uh, it looks good because I'm looking at the picture. It is it's like a 10 story building. Are they, uh, you've, got, you've got quite a few projects in Ash, Ashford or are they the one project? Well, this is our second one in Ashford and we yeah. are looking to do more over time because we see mm. it as a, a very strong investment case for some of the reasons mm. that I've mentioned earlier, but there's yeah. a lot more uh, to Ashford than uh, what mm. I've already said. But it is a, it's a great um, development, 143 units, mm. um, literally, as I mentioned, right next to Victoria Park and the River Stour. Mm. You're a four minute walk to Elwick Place, which is the local uh, mm. shopping mall and leisure center with gyms, cinemas, bars, restaurants. Mm. You have uh, something uh, called the, uh, the Curious Brewery, which is uh, a huge brewery. Uh, Ashford is in the, uh, the uh, county that's called Kent, and it's often mm. known as the Garden of England. Yes. And although you lived in Bordeaux, where it's famous yes. for winemaking, and I yeah. perhaps won't compare with Bordeaux, but the winemaking region of England oh, is in the county in of Kent. Kent. I and, see. Uh, the Curious Brewery, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a showroom for wow. one of the major brewers of yeah. not only wine, but beers as well. Yeah. That's a four minute walk away. The international yeah. station is 10 minutes away. The center of the, yeah. the town is eight minutes away. Um, it's got a great international college. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's recently uh, just launched something called Network. Uh, network town and this is mm. an old train station that's been yeah. renovated uh, yeah. investing over 250 million pounds yeah. to make it into uh, creative tech studios and yeah. we've seen amazon prime netflix um and one of the um uh producer of content uh, signing wow. up their uk officers in uh, uh, uh new town work sorry so it's it's a great place. It's it's got a um, uh, for those who need the retail therapy, uh, it has a, a premium outlet. And <laughs> those people are not familiar with premium outlets. These are sort of designer yeah. shops, and it attracts over three million people every single yeah. year into the yeah. town of Ashford just to visit this this one premium outlet shopping mall. So. It's a real buzzing place. The population is uh, estimated to be rising significantly, mm. and that's causing a real crunch on the, the housing shortage. And within the last year or two, more and more people are looking for towns like yeah. Ashford because yeah. it's cheaper. They get more bang for their buck, but they can still connect into major cities because of the connectivity of the railway system. Yeah, and, and you know, um, like in France, um, the studies have shown, or the statistics are that um, uh, property or home ownership is 30%, it's 29.2%. And the rest of the people just rent. It is so different from like in Asia or in Singapore, whereby, you know, a lot of us in Singapore, 90%, we are homeowners. Um, you know, that that's where the rental market is because you've got um, a huge number of people queuing up for the apartment. Uh, just to rent. Uh, what's the numbers like uh, there in, in the UK or in, in well, it, it, It's changed over time. Um, the UK, I mean, there's a famous English saying that an Englishman's yeah. house is his castle. And like a lot of Singaporeans <laughs> and uh, quite a lot of Asians, yeah. people save up money to, to buy their first property and get on the yeah. housing ladder. Yeah. I remember listening to a, a UK, uh, sorry, a BBC story a few years yeah. ago where 20 years ago, the average time it took for a graduate to get on their first property was about three to four years. Mm, so let's say wow. that you know, they're, they graduate in the UK, 22 years old, they're looking at maybe 25, 26 to get on the property ladder. Yeah. They were saying, this was about two years ago, that the average age is now 38. Mm. And it's predicted to go up to 42. And the reason being is that prices of property have gone up. Mm. The loans of value, it's a different economic the factors. Yep. Are now um, yep. uh, lesser. So rather than being able to get a 95% mortgage after yep. the global financial uh, crisis, which was yep. uh, driven partly by the 
uh, a housing issue, yeah. banks became much stricter on how much they will lend. And so now you might yeah. be talking 20, 30 uh, percent deposit and the young generation yeah. just don't have enough funds. So unfortunately, they are forced to rent. Mm. So I feel sorry for the young generation because the only way that many of them can get onto the property ladder is through what we call the bank of mum and yeah. dad. And yeah. this is becoming a common term. The bank yeah. of mum and dad is having to help their kids yeah. uh, get on that property ladder. Otherwise, yeah. they can end up renting. But the flip side of that is if you're an investor, yeah. then having a massive pool of tenants yeah. is a good thing. Um, mm. And when there is a lack of property on the yeah. market, it yeah. means that when units come up, yeah. they get snapped up. Yeah, sure. That's wonderful. And uh, I've, I've gotten you for almost 60 minutes. It's so interesting. It just kind of like just went past like five minutes because this is this is something so real and something so relevant to a lot of us, uh, Richard. Um, the final 30 seconds, are you able to wrap up about exiting the investment? Um, and uh, how do you actually go about like offloading this investment? Well, we basically work with many uh, real estate agencies across the UK. If you market a property at a yeah. fair market price yeah. and you're in a, uh, a market whereby there is an undersupply of property, mm. you mm. can always sell a property. Mm. If you're trying to market the property way above uh, fair market value yeah. and there's something, there's nothing unique about your property, don't be surprised if it sits on the market for a long time. So mm. whatever the property is, if you market it at fair market value, you can yeah. always sell it. If you basically market it when it's undervalued, it'll get snapped up. Sure. Now, on top of that, because yeah. of the pandemic, yeah. The supply of property, not just in Ashford, but in many places across the UK, has become even more undersupplied. And the reason yeah. for that is that planning permission uh, departments have been on furlough, so the planning approvals slow down. Yeah. Uh, contractors sure. often haven't been able to get on site, so sure. uh, projects have been delayed, which Blood. has yeah. meant there's been an even more pent up demand. Yeah. And yes. Because of the low interest rates, uh, a temporary stamp duty holiday that was in the UK just recently, yeah. and the fact that people want to then take advantage of these factors yeah. to upgrade has yeah. meant that there is just an absolute major wow. supply. So prices are driving up and when properties are on the market, they are getting snapped up these days. Wow. So that's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, very exciting future for a lot of us. Um, you know, Richard has been so kind to spend the last 60 minutes to tell us about those dreams um, that we are all waiting to live again, um, you know, in UK. And, and Richard, um, you have a seminar coming up. I, I'm not quite sure if uh, by the video, um, if it's released, uh, we'll be able to catch that. But you know, you always have a lot of webinars, right? And what do you talk about in your webinars? I do maybe two or three webinars or events uh, every single month on different topics within yep. the real estate and investment industry. Yeah. As you mentioned, we have a event at the Four Seasons Hotel yep. here in Singapore yep. on November the 6th and 7th. So yep. all are, are very welcome. You yep. just need to email me. I'll be yep. happy to forward you the details. Uh, yep. My email address is yep. richardlow at ogpsglobal.com. Uh, Richard Lowe, that's L-O-W-E, that's my family name, even, yep. <laughs> even though yep, it, sounds like, a, it, it yep. sounds like an Asian Richard. name. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so Richard Lowe at OGPSglobal.com, uh, uh, I'll be more than happy to send you the details. We're having an event, it's basically a London workshop and we're going to be having many guest speakers, not just myself, mm. on multiple topics over the weekend. Mm on mm. different aspects of investing in the real estate market. So you can actually kill many birds with one stone because you can come and enjoy multiple events yeah. and, and learn a great deal with some real keynote uh, experts in their field. So we've got people from uh, mortgage brokers, tax consultants, mm. wow. uh, talking about the market. Coming in from the UK? Uh, they're mainly based in this part of the world. Um, they're expats living here, but servicing mm. uh, people in this part of the world. 
Yeah. So it's going to be a, a great event if you wish to wow. come along and learn about the real estate market. One of the topics I'm going to do, which will be quite interesting, is literally comparing yeah. the return on investment of yeah. investing in an entry level property here in Singapore yeah. and an Versus... entry level property in London. Yeah. And you'll be amazed at the difference in the return on investment mm. based wow. on the amount of deposit based on the loan to value based on the stamp duty uh, that you need to pay mm. and the, the, mm. the kinds of mortgages you can get with interest only as opposed to principal and interest uh, mm. the cash flow that that then produces so watch this space come along and uh, you'll yeah. hear more about sounds really exciting you know pros and cons yeah. of and I think, in London and, and I, Singapore. yeah, you got it right there. They hit the nail on the head. That number one step is qualifying the your client, right? You don't want to go through the whole process, and then your client is not qualified for a particular uh, mortgage, and you know the client has got to take out cash, etc. And then the re-design uh, the whole investment portfolio. Um, glad that you have got brokers there, and they're so important. They they have such great expertise, right? I mean, they know exactly what the banks are doing, um, which banks require what uh, papers, um, and the paper could be quite a lot, and they've got to qualify the first round themselves uh, as the brokers, and then before presenting it to the banks. And uh, they would kind of know, are you 90 percent, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, assured that you can get uh, your loan. So I think the brokers are important uh, as in any form of investment. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm so excited for you, Richard. Um, well, thank you for having me again. It's been a yeah, real yeah, pleasure. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just waiting for your webinars or seminars to go live so that people can watch wherever they are. You know, one day, maybe soon, um, I'll see you and your experts live on YouTube or in your own podcast. Um, ladies and gentlemen, and that's very, very intense information from Richard and from his um, explanation. You can see that he's someone who is a guru in investing in properties. You should go to him. And his uh, email address is just uh, uh, repeated. Please go and click and, and uh, jot down his email. And you know, uh, Richard, um, your videos are going to go to all podcast catchers in over 30 countries and definitely uh, the videos are going to go to US and a lot of a lot more uh, podcast TV. I'm so glad to have you. You've given a great insight about UK. Definitely for myself, it's an eye opener. You know, I've never really considered that, but maybe we should. So Richard, any final 10 seconds uh, to say uh, before we say goodbye? Yeah. The event that we're doing at this uh, on November the sixth and seventh. If you're not physically here in Singapore, again, just email me, mm. and uh, I'll be more than happy to forward you any of the uh, seminars. We'll be recording them all. So again, just email me, Richard Low at ogpsglobal.com, and I'll be more than happy to send you the invitation, and we'll then forward you any of the uh, recordings. So. Look forward to seeing you there, either in person or virtually at some stage. Yeah, so, yeah thank sure. You. Yeah, and, and of course, because Richard, um, we are all in this digital um, immortal world for perpetuity. Now, if anyone missed any of these uh, webinars or seminars, um, and if you're interested, you can always go to Richard. Um, you know, he's told us a lot about himself, his philosophy, and also One Global, what they stand for. The, um, the services that they provide. I hope you can go to them. And this is myself signing off uh, from Singapore. And that's Richard Lowe. Um, and we are uh, broadcasting to you from Singapore to the rest of the world. Thank you so much, Richard. I look forward to seeing you again for the third um, episode of your show. <laughs>